Welcome to Messy Parenting, a Catholic conversation on marriage and family. I'm Mike Hernan. And I'm Alicia Hernan. And uh, Messy Parenting podcast is uh, intent on giving you some thoughts, advice, wisdom from our 21 years of marriage and our 10 I children. I thought you were going to say from our non-expert. Yeah. Well, it's definitely from a non-expert you, uh... position for sure. Um, so, you know... Uh, Listener, beware. That's uh, right. We have failed at probably at least as much as we have succeeded. <laughs> um, but our hope is that, that it starts a conversation with you as we share some of the uh, insights and ups and downs uh, that we've had in the last 21 years of marriage, 10 kids. Mm-hmm. You know, pretty pretty interesting uh, background. But anyway, today, um, since not all, but many of the people who listen to the podcast, as we've seen from our uh, some of the surveys in the past, uh, are millennials. Right. And we were going to talk about that. And there was what inspired our podcast today is there's an article in Time magazine, if any of you get time, um, called Help, My Parents Are Millennials. <laughs> <laughs> and when I was reading it, I really felt like it opened my eyes to what a lot of young parents today are dealing with. And so we thought, you know what, let's respond to this article because I feel like it was in many ways like a cry for help. That's, so um, That's a good, that's a good, good tip very, off here. Yeah, it was so a really good article. Let's uh, start with prayer. Okay. So in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, we ask for your Holy Spirit to come and be with us as we do this podcast and bless those who are listening right now. Bless all those parents um, who are either raising children alone, raising children with their husband or wife, Bless their families that they came from and just affirm them, Lord, in their parenting and the, the gifts that you have given each one of them and the grace and the authority that you've given them to be the parents who you want them to be. We ask this through Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank you. All right. So first I thought it would be important just to kind of just define our generations. We're talking about generations. Generations typically is about a 20-year uh, span of time. And uh, the easiest one to define is baby boomers. Baby boomers were born between 1946 and 1964. Born uh, after World War II. Right. So mm-hmm. after World War II, everyone was coming home. And guess what? They were having babies. Everyone was excited. There right. was new hope in the world. Basically our 70 and 80-year-olds today. Right. Okay. Right. So, uh, no, no, no. I mean, your parents. Right? My yeah, I guess parents. Are, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. All right. Yeah, I guess you're right. But then they also remember who had the whole, they were revolting against the moral conservative upbringing that they had. Then there's Generation X. Uh, Alicia and I are in Generation X. Uh, typically, right. you know, mid, late 60s uh, into early 80s. Um, and, uh, you know, we lived through the Cold War and so forth. 30 and 40-year-olds. Yeah, Mm -hmm. give or take. And then we come to what first started being called Generation Y. We're not sure why, but... uh, Well, it was a stupid name, whoever thought Yeah, yeah, yeah. They were just like, (laughs) well, X, and then what comes after X? (laughs) Exactly. That was just dumb. Yeah. Millennials is much better. Yeah, so millennials, (laughs) you know, those who uh, are growing up in the, uh, the new millennium, uh, so typically from the early 80s into the early 2000s, um, they're very educated. So if you're a millennial, be, be encouraged. Uh, you but obviously heavily sh- shaped by technology. Right. Uh, but during your, your lifetime, you, unlike uh, we grew up uh, as kids, at least in the Cold War, you grew up with 9-11, you grew up with the Iran-Afghanistan wars, shootings in schools and so forth. Um, but uh, it's interesting the um, uh, I was looking around thinking, okay, well, how uh, how do you know you're a millennial? So that that's a time frame, but you know, uh, Jeff Foxworthy had this thing, you know, you know, you're a redneck if. So I thought I thought it would I was be- going to say, well. Generation Xers know who <laughs> Jeff Foxworthy is. I don't know if millennials know who oh, he shoot. is. Oh, <laughs> shoot. All right. Well, maybe this See, we're showing our age here. <laughs> I didn't think of that. Okay. Well, anyway, but I, I just found a couple things I thought might be interesting. You it, might be a millennial if. <laughs> you might be a millennial if, if you are searchable on all or most social media platforms. Mm-hmm. You have binged watched an entire TV series in one sitting. And you have done that multiple times. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Now, some of us can do that regardless of our generation. I know Jim Gaffigan jokes about that a lot. That's right. Um, you have a favorite mashup. Now we had to ask our daughter what a mashup was. Yeah. So we are, we are so not we are millennials. Not millennials. <laughs> um, you take selfies regularly. Again, my children had to teach me how to do selfies a couple years ago. <laughs> you know what Vine is. And if you do, I, I don't know what Vine is. <laughs> But uh, but you use emojis. Mm-hmm. You uh, may have a tattoo or a piercing, or have seriously considered getting one. 
Yes. You are. No, uh, Mike and I know. No, but. <laughs> uh, correct. That's right. That did not come up for us. <laughs> no. But millennials. But we know lots of people who do. That's right. Who, who are, are millennials. Younger than us. <laughs> uh, you are a vegan or have a close friend who is a vegan. Uh, and you had to set up your parents' computer, and now you're upset when they're on Facebook. <laughs> or you were upset or when were. they got Back on Facebook. Or were, back at the time, <laughs> back at the time, right, yeah, yeah. yeah. But all... as young parents, I don't think that you would be upset because you probably enjoy, most people enjoy sharing their pictures of their kids and stuff. Right, right. Now as um, parents, it's a different scenario. Right, and um, one of the things that I thought was interesting about this article in Time Magazine, was it's a very big article, but just kind of learning a little bit more about parents that really that we're speaking to because like mike said when we did our survey we found a lot of parents in this generation but um that only 60 percent grew up in a two-parent home right and many are back either um like many, a, yeah. uh, maybe you have lived with your parents before you got married um but maybe you got married a little bit later and so i can think that kind of changes things and it also changes how you raise your kids, your perspective on life, your marriage. And and I think that that's, you know, it's important. And I think that that's maybe one of the reasons why, too, this podcast is being listened to by this generation because maybe you're looking for, well, how do I not make the mistakes my right. parents made? How do we stay together? How do we keep our marriage alive and and unified? So, you know, so I don't wind up having to raise my children by myself right. you know, or, God forbid, through a broken marriage. So, um, and also, uh, millennials usually have children later, right. uh, 26 is the average to have your first child at 26 and some, cause some people just getting married later. I think even good Catholics just don't find the right person as that's easily right. as you used to. Yeah. You know? I mean, it's and not, it's, it's not untypical, uh, for, uh, and this would be interesting to, it's kind to of see the way it is that people are getting married 26, 27, 28, 29, 30 year right. old, um, you know, getting married and that's, you know, that, that might be part of our culture as a whole, but but more particularly in this generation. Um, but they they desire, I, I don't know if there's anything else on the, the parenting side. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, they desire good work-life balance and um, uh, and to, to kind of sate their desire for a fulfilling job. They're frequent job hoppers, which can be frustrating to some employers with mm -hmm. some kind of mm -hmm. low retention rates. They're just looking for But the upside, too, is that I think that there's more stay-at-home. Well, from what the research the shows is that yeah. there's more stay-at-home parents. So there's more people who are saying, you know what? I grew up as a latchkey kid. That's right. Um, you know, in our generation, I knew lots of kids who came home and nobody was home. That's and so right. there's a lot of parents now that are like, you know what? I'm not doing that to my yeah, kids. That's right. That's you know, right. We're, we're doing what we have to do, which is a really awesome thing. It's like the pendulum is swinging in, in a good way, you know, because somebody has to be there for the children. So, and um, go ahead. You want to do that one? And then just last thing, and this is kind of something we're going to talk about later, but um, there's lots of different, um, for millennials, use a lot of different child-raising philosophies in their homes. So there's more people are doing like kind of a mishmash of like more like baby wearing and organic, organic foods and more free range parents who don't believe in boundaries. And um, I think basically what I see is that um, if you grew up in not in an intact home, if 60% grew up without a two parent family and um, you can't look previous generations for thousands of years people mothers and fathers would raise their children the way that they were raised in general most people would do that but if you really feel like there was nobody there for you your parents really didn't raise you now you're looking for direction what do we do how, how do we do this and so you know just trying to figure it out again you know, kind of like creating something. So on one hand, it's feel like millennials tend, can be rejecting or have really no experience of, you know, not even rejecting, but just having no experience of growing up in a traditional family. But then to something needs to replace that to give you direction. And so you're looking for advice because there's no moorings. And I think that this is one of the things that, um, right now, the synod of the family is happening it over in Rome, just yeah. closed. And and I think that this is exactly, this is why the dis, dissolution of the family and the breaking down of the family is so hard right. because then it leaves young parents without 
with not knowing what to do right. when, when they want to raise their family right and stay together and make their kids Catholic. They don't. You don't have any frame of reference for right. how to do that's that. Right. And, and, and that's a tragedy. And, yeah, and and there are there are two sides of that. Obviously, as you already said, you know, there's there's the one part where maybe they don't have that experience, they don't have that mooring, or it hasn't been effectively passed on. Even if there was an intact exactly. family, it wasn't effectively passed on. But there's also a sense within millennials. Again, every generation has its 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 strengths, challenges, its mm -hmm. strengths and its weaknesses. It's you know different perspectives. Uh, but one of the uh, our radio talk show hosts uh, says, you know, uh, it doesn't matter matter what what is a um 2000 years of tradition means nothing now that i'm here you know and and there's the liberal perspective <laughs> well i mean and sometimes that there's there is there is um yeah you are you unique yes you are different mm -hmm. it's like but you know let's not rewrite everything necessarily exactly uh, exactly right. so anyway so we we, we want to look at a little bit of the issues and challenges that we saw from this um this article and some of the the insights that they brought into millennials particularly into their parenting and like we said the reason that we're bringing this up is because i think that these issues are things that maybe you um are being challenged with from your own life or people around you are being challenged um and that these that these um, these issues are at work you know these these, right. these and you know I, I we should make some disclaimer here just because you're a millennial doesn't mean you're going to suffer from this. That's what I'm trying to say. And, exactly. And also, too, if you're not a millennial, doesn't mean you aren't suffering from this. <laughs> you know, but these are just trends. There's things that that we're looking at that are right. more susceptible and more um, uh, present mm -hmm. uh, or more prevalent in this generation. That doesn't mean that it, it isn't you, and you could be absolutely nothing like any of these, and you could be a baby boomer and experience some of these. And they are challenges for all of us, regardless of your generation. It just happens to be more prevalent uh, among generation uh, or the millennial generation. Right, and even if you aren't experiencing these challenges, the people around you yeah. probably are. And the reality, if they are around you, your generation, people you're growing up with, you might be married to somebody who's challenged with this. <laughs> or, right. or we do have some who aren't married yet, who are uh, looking. Right, exactly. Looking. You, you might be married to someone like that. And just to deal with that, to recognize that, and to just, again, like we say a lot of things, just, you know, when you're more aware of it, you can be more responsive and be more intentional in how you approach things. Because right. just because you grew up with the air you breathe, you, sometimes you need to self-reflect a little bit. Exactly. And, uh, and so again, and for those who are not millennials, you either know people who are, or these same issues might be present for us as well. Right. So one of the first things is... Okay, so one of the first things that was brought up in this article was that more than any other generation, millennials are looking for guidance and affirmation on the internet. Right. And for many... And so let me just say that as a podcast <laughs> online, we affirm you. <laughs> exactly. We affirm you. But I was about to ask, like, yeah, that's kind of like what we're doing. Yeah, <laughs> like, I don't know. Yeah, I don't know if we have We are people now. you don't know giving you advice and affirmation on the internet. But no, we're different. You can listen to us. That's right. Yeah, we're, we're the people you can trust <laughs> on the interweb. So anyway, but, <laughs> but I think more... The point was, is that it can be an inf information overload of so many sources saying, yes, you should do cloth diapers. If you don't do cloth diapers, you will ruin your child. That's right. Or if you, what are you, you're, you should never do cloth diapers. They're horrible. You're going to drive yourself crazy. You know, and it can drive you Yeah, because you have all these contradictory crazy. information that's that's coming at you. Exactly. And it just, it's... It drains your energy, drains your mind, and you don't end up with anything that makes any sense in the end. And it can be um, unnamed blogs and right. people like that and like online magazines, but it can also be social media friends, friends of yours, you know, saying, oh, you should do this way. Oh, you should go to work. Oh, you shouldn't go to work. You should have a part-time job. You shouldn't have a part-time job. Right. And everyone is very... People are, I mean, naturally, I am, most people are really opinionated, you know, and that none of the sources really are going to be authoritative in your life, but people acting like they can tell you what to do. And some, when these things contradict each other, it can be very, very overwhelming, especially when you're a young mom. Sure. I mean, I didn't have 
the internet. The internet wasn't around when I was when I started out our family. But I remember. Thank God. Because <laughs> I would have been on there for crazy. hours. Because she was crazy. I mean, because I remember just coming home and you had read, you know, three different books. And we had were, these things called books back then. Yeah, we didn't I don't just know if Google. people know what they are. <laughs> You know, not, not the things Just pre pre Kindle. <laughs> um, so, but but she but the, each of the books had a very polar right. opposite uh, a, a view of attachment, parenting, breastfeeding, um, all these different things on on being a new mom that she was consuming, as well as her own experience of her family growing up. So you had like three or four different opinions, and they all said, "You're going to go to hell if you don't do this. Your kids are going to be psychologically <laughs> damaged." Yeah. Anyway, so but but so we had to put the books down and just say, "Look." I, I literally you... remember my coming home from work and me, and this is when I was pregnant with Katie, just being like, I don't know what to do. I, do I put Mike in on a schedule? Do we not? What are we going to do with this baby? And Mike just looked at me and said, I am taking all the books away. I am taking them away. You are not allowed to read one more book. I have had it. We are going to have this baby, and we are just going to do what we think is right when this baby comes. <laughs> and that's what I would say to you. Sometimes you just... Step away from the computer, Put your mom. hands in the air. Step exactly. back from the computer. Dad, go change the password. <laughs> like, uh, don't let her on the computer. Right. Because it can be overwhelming. And in the end, no one can make those decisions for you. Right. You need to decide for your family what is right. You can take in information only as other people people's opinions right and at, a, at some point you're gonna be saturated with opinions and you got to stop that's right because you know in the in the days gone by you know we would have talked to a, a family member or a friend and it would have been a very small group that would have mm -hmm. gotten an opinion from and that would have been the end of it and we would have made our decision but now people are going out and crowdsourcing for advice they're going out online right. and i do this too hey i'm looking for advice on something you know for the house or whatever and i'll put it on facebook or wherever and i'll get some great yeah, Advice, exactly. Which Sometimes is, it's never, very helpful. Which is never a problem. Right. But if you're thinking about it, and it's it's two ways. One, you're often looking for that advice and affirmation, as well as people are happy to tell you whether or not you wanted it, <laughs> what they think you're doing wrong or what you're doing right, for right. that matter. Right. I just think that you need, moms especially, need to stop looking for the perfect answer because right. it just there there is no perfect answer many times. And you need to gain your confidence in what you think is right. And that's one thing I, I can't say that we really tried to do on this podcast is that we can tell you this is what we've done. That's right. And this is, this is our opinion. But in the end, God has given you the grace to parent your child. That's right. And we need to stop spending so much time that's and energy say. and investment and in being on the Internet and just start doing it. Yeah. Just start doing it and stop being afraid of making a mistake because guess what? You're going to make a mistake. <laughs> it's going to happen. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Well, yeah, I mean, you are, I mean, there was a great book. You're a better parent than you think, right? That's right. It was Ray a good Grundy. book, right? Yep. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, that was Ray? Yes. Okay. And, and, and the reality is, is that we have all, I mean, if you're, you're a Catholic and you're in a Catholic marriage, you've received a sacramental grace. This is not something light. This is not something, yeah. this is power. And, you know, we're not going to get it right every time. We're human. We're frail. But you know what? Step out. Be bold. Be courageous. Be a parent. Right. You know? And uh, the, the, one of the comments in the article were about the, this mom who spent – her daughter had an earache or something like that. And she spent all this time searching online for the best pediatrician and getting advice and looking at these different reviews. And she spent all this time and felt like she was nowhere and went to the pediatrician she, she always had gone to. Who had she had to drive forty five minutes to go to? She was just like, forget it. This, sa this saves saying. me. I, I just wasted two and a half hours looking for somebody when yeah. I didn't want to drive forty five minutes to the pediatrician that I liked before. Exactly. So anyway, it's it, time suck, but it also is uh, is a challenge to make sure you're not looking for your affirmation, right? Um, and allowing other people's opinion to sway you, because uh, mm -hmm. ultimately it's you and your spouse. You've right. got to stand together in this uh, th this world in general, but particularly with your parenting. Right. Now, then there's this whole idea, too, of like mom petition, like competition, mom petition, you know, like, is my child, uh, you know, living up to the expectations or living up to everybody else's child? Oh, my kid. Oh, look, somebody's walking when they're seven months old or they're walking when they're 11 months old. My kid is just rolling around on the floor. They're not doing He's anything, dirt, you, you know? know. Yeah. Or they're not keeping up. And this really actually like stabbed me in the heart um 
I'm just going to read this from the article here. It says, the pressure among millennials to be great parents is fierce. In February, parenting site Baby Center released its annual report. It surveyed 2,700 mothers, 18 to 44, and found that 80% of millennial moms say it's important to be the perfect mom. Compared with about 70% of moms in Generation X and 64% of moms across age groups. And they all say that parenting is more competitive it used to be than it used to be. When I read that, I honestly, I felt like I was just stabbed in the heart. I just, I am so sorry that all of these women, that 80% of the women probably listen to this podcast, feel that it is very important to be the perfect mom. Yeah. Because you're not going to be the perfect mom. You know who's the perfect mom? Mary. Mary is the perfect mother. And I don't think the Blessed Mother is listening to this podcast right now. She doesn't need it. Right. We just need, we need to let that go, okay? Yeah. And just concentrate on being the mother that God wants you to be for your child. Because what is the perfect mom? Yeah. I don't know. I have no idea what the perfect mom is. You know, like I, some days I feel like I'm the perfect mom. Some days I feel like I'm a horrible mother, <laughs> yeah. you know? And again, it's about each one of us getting to heaven. Right. Our children are not status symbols. Our, we do not, I do not have children and dress them so cute and make the rooms perfect and do the perfect birthday party because I want to look good. I want to hold up this child That's as right. I would hold up like, my home or my garden or a, a beautiful meal that I made. They're not my possession. Exactly. Yeah. You're ch and we, and that is like one of these things that even if you are listening to this saying, well, I don't think that way. Maybe you don't think that way, but people around you do. And you're going to be affected by that. I'm going to be affected by that. Right, and right. we need to say it and be aware of it. Right. That we are treating our children with the dignity of who they are as individual people. And again, we said this in our very first podcast and I'll just say it now. You are not, your worth is not based on how successful and beautiful and cute your children are. That is not what your worth is based on. Your worth is based on the fact that you are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. That is what your worth is based on. And your child can grow up I mean, I hope this doesn't happen, but Charles could grow up to be Charles Manson. <laughs> and you are still worth it. You are still a daughter of God. And that's where your dignity is based on. Yeah. But um, we, we need to stop using our children to compete with each other. Right. Yeah, and we're not saying you can't have the great parties. We can't say you can put the pictures on. But it's just like remembering that. Check yourself. Keep it in as your a, heart. Yeah, keep yeah. it in your heart and in your mind. You know, these are, I'm doing it first for my kids. I'm doing these mm -hmm. parties. I'm doing the, the clothes or whatever to teach them, to show them, to parent and to, to love, love them. To love them. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I believe me, I, I throw birthday parties for every one of my kids, and I love doing birthday parties. My girls go to homecoming. They go to prom. We buy the dresses. We do the hair. We get the flowers. You know, I, I'm not saying that at all, but in my heart, I need to be doing these things because I love my children. But not as a status symbol. Not because I want to look good to other people. Good. That's a good point. And I think that that's, that's just like a very, that's a very, very big thing. Another temptation um, that, that I saw in the article was to, the, the temptation to run their family as a mini democracy mm -hmm. where you're seeking consensus from kids from, you know, spouse and, and the, as we talked about, the friends outside, even on the smallest decisions. Right. I mean, and it's just like, you know, our family is run by my wife and I. It's right. it's Hernan Inc. for us. You know, this is our <laughs> this is our show. We're 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 co CEOs. Mm -hmm. um, or I am the uh, I am the king, and she's the prime minister. <laughs> right. Basically, in charge. Um, exactly. And I'm a figurehead. And um, <laughs> whatever. But 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 the, the reality is, is that that too often they, we quickly slip. Uh, or, or there's a greater temptation, I guess, from millennials to want to. Um, really take a consensus on everything. Hey, what do you want to mm -hmm. have for dinner tonight? Hey, you know, what do you guys think about this? Hey, you know, and all of those kind of checking the sense of polling your kids. Right. Like we just see it in TV shows. You know, we watched, uh, mm -hmm. uh, what is it, Parenthood or whatever that show is. Yeah. And they often, there's a couple, there's one couple in that show that uh, talks to their kids a lot about, mm -hmm. well, what do you want to do? What do you want to do? Not that you don't want to ask what their kids want to do, but you right. run the family. Well, it's really, it comes from in this, you know, in this article, it was saying it really comes from the desire of the millennial generation That's for right. fairness. 
um, for fairness and that it's insistence on fairness. So the command and control model isn't there that millennials want at their core believers in democracy. And so that's where it comes from when you have kids, you're asking them, what do they want to do? And that in some, okay, so in some senses, uh, sometimes that is uh, fine. Very appropriate, right? Absolutely. I think especially when you have teenagers. Right, yeah. I think that that is a time when it's really, when you're going on your family vacation to talk to them. You know, what do you want to do? Because it's part of that transition for them into adulthood. Growing, yeah, but maturity. you know what? When we go on vacation, honestly, our kids that are younger than 10, I do not ask them what they're going to do, right. <laughs> what they want to do. They don't know what they want to do. They, they have had so few experiences in life. They, the realm of possibilities is way um, they would be like, we want to go to McDonald's. Right. You know what I mean? It's just like, well, do you realize that we're talking about we can go to the beach, we can go to the mountains, we can go to a lake, we can go, you know, to whatever. But they have so, they don't have the experience necessary to be a, um, to, to offer a contribution to that kind of decision. Right. And that's where I think that millennials, uh, you can really be, if you kind of get into that mindset of like, oh, we're going to all, you're giving your child a voice, but you do realize that you have had a hundred times the life experience that your child has right, had. Right, and so, and then, and that comes into play when you see much more serious decisions, whether it be vacations, which is an important one in some mm -hmm. ways, but then even more like, oh, do you want to be on this team or not be on this team? Well, if they've never been on a, a soccer team. Exactly. You know, what it, you know? They don't know what they want. They don't know, they and maybe maybe they do want it. Maybe they don't. But you know what? If you as a parent think this is the right decision, you know, we had a whole exactly. podcast on activities. Obviously, there's a whole exactly. other conversation there. But the reality is, is that you do know best. Mm -hmm. Not you won't be right every time, and we're not saying right. That. You're not omniscient. Like right. you are not all knowing. But the the reality is, is that if you just you know more than your kid does, yeah. and, and and it's unfair <laughs> for your kid. It's unfair for you. And I think this might be a shocker for some millennials to think it's actually unfair to ask your kid all of those things right why is that why because the reality is is that they do have they, they find security um, they find stability they find sustenance when they don't have to be in charge of everything that's right and they want a routine they want to know that there is somebody there who is making the calls for them mm -hmm. who's making the decisions they don't always like all the decisions i'm not gonna say they're gonna you know fall down and bow and and, and kiss right. your hand but the reality is is that's where their um, their inner peace if you will i think um, that kids gain security from knowing that they're not in charge. That's right. Because they know, I mean, maybe they, they know subconsciously, they shouldn't be in charge. Right. They're, I'm a little kid. I don't know. That's you know adding I, a lot of stress, possibly. Exactly. And, and, and exactly. depending on the personality, they may not be able to make a decision. Right. And then another, you know, our, our child number 10 would probably want to rule the family right now <laughs> and thinks she can rule the family. Um, but you know what? It, it's not good for her. It's not good for anybody to exactly. put them in that position where you're giving them greater authority and power. Um, and it's just not, it's not healthy. But again, exactly. we're not saying as you grow, as you're, you know, preteen, teens, you're going to start engaging them in more things. Not that you don't talk to your little guys too, but. Right. Yeah, I, I'm anyway, uh, sorry. We, we, we've hit that. <laughs> yeah, but I think that that's really important as well because, well, these some of the terms that most people are looking for qualities in their children. Millennials are looking for to raise kids who are open minded or empathetic and questioning. And that's what they want. These are qualities that a lot of millennial parents want for their children. Right. In and of themselves, there's nothing wrong. Really. Right. I don't think there's anything wrong with those things, but I think it is more important that you have children who are respectful, who are obedient, who are humble. Who are loving. Right. That's the kind of, that is much more important to me. It's much more important to me that my child is respectful than it is that they're questioning. Right. Because if you have kids who are questioning without being respectful, that actually ultimately what that is, it's a lack of humility. And humility is the number one virtue we need yeah. to instill in our children. So true. And I really think that as millennials, I think that that generation is being, it's overlooking that virtue of humility. And I think that that's why, the, again, the danger of running your family in like a democracy because you're not really giving your child that opportunity to develop that humility because they need to learn that 
They're not the top dog. And you know what? Sometimes your opinion doesn't count. That's right. You know, and, and I have I say that many times to my child. You know, when they're complaining, I'll be like, you need to stop talking now because nobody cares. Like I <laughs> You're so bad. I'm very yeah. bad. And I'm not very bad. No. I am honest. <laughs> Just, <yeah. laughs> I'm very honest with them because it's like, you know what? Sometimes and that that's life. You know, if we have to do this, if we have to get in the car and go to the store, if we have to get in the car and go to church and they don't want to go, please stop complaining because I don't care. We're moving. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and you see, that, that's the thing, too, is that, if we, again, if we get into this trap, and again, this, is, this goes beyond any generation, really, but, but it, again, it's more prevalent necessarily in, in the millennials. If your kids don't want to go to church, if your kids don't want to do something that is, you know is good for them, I think you'll want to put your foot down. But what is the foundation you've laid all along? Right. Is it only putting your foot down when you're going to church? Because then it's then you're then That's you're connotating good, good. that that this is the only thing that you're going to have this division over. Right. And that's not healthy. No. So, you know, you need to make sure that not in every situation, but you're 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 making sure that in a number of areas in their life, you're the parent not seeking their input, but you're guiding them. That you're lovingly, charitably, mm -hmm. joyfully, persuasively leading them in the right decisions and, the, and where you're, what you're doing. It's like, sorry, were you about to say? Well, I was just going to say one thing that I am more and more convinced of as, as we are continuing to parent our children is how important those early years are. Yeah. You are laying such an important foundation very, very in those true. early years. You know, if because like Mike just said, if you're going to put your foot down when they're a teenager and they say I don't want to go to church anymore, but their whole life you have always asked their opinion. You have always allowed run your family like a democracy. You've always let them do what they want to do. You know, it or or have their opinions heard in that right. way. Well, then, of course, they're going to. Why would they listen to you when they're a teenager? It, I'm just more and more convinced that that um, the humility, the obedience, the respect, the relationship between you and them, the opening, the communication that you have with your children, all of that that you are building in that under 12 time, under 10 years it is so important yeah, because it is, it's a foundation. And, and, and it's the only thing you'll be able to draw on in the teenage and then the post-teenage exactly. you know, years. Because they're so open when they're little. They are so open. And it's easy to parent, more easy. It's easier to parent them at that time. And so sometimes yes. you can kind of rest on your laurels and be like, oh, come on, we'll just do whatever you want. But you got to keep laying that foundation because – because you're going to want to draw back on that when they really start pushing back yeah. when they get to be teenagers, which is very natural and fine, but you got to have a good foundation. And, and again, this, this may not be um, uh, representative of the folks listening to this podcast, but you know, people who are like, well, I'm going to let my kids decide what they do with sex, what they do with whether they do religion or not, or whether, you know, whatever it might be. Well, we know people who have said to their teenagers, right. you know, if you don't uh, have a 15 year old, said you know what i just don't want to go to church anymore and they said well, okay right. you know because they felt and these are good people very good people and they felt like they couldn't tell their they didn't want religion to be something to be forced and it's like it, it, what would you know again back to the previous comment but then even going forward it's like would you say that about um you know let's just use smoking or food it's like you know if they're, they're i think smoking is the best example because that's such a hot button issue if your 15 year old came to you and said i want to start smoking would you be like okay it's like, no parent not. would do that. That's they right. wouldn't do that. Right. Or, or all I want to eat today is just junk food. I want nothing but junk food. Mm. And it's like, I mean. Actually, that, I think that's what Maura eats all day. Oh, <laughs> shoot. But you know what I mean? Like, like all these things, it's like, okay, you know, when we get to our faith, and for us, again, people on this podcast, that may not be the case, but, you know, we got to realize that. And, and we're building that foundation. But we're also... This is this is life. We're our, we're their parents, not just of their soul, but their bodies, everything. And it's like, mm. let's not cheapen that. Let's not. Yeah, miss I don't that think point. that we should allow our children, even if you have a teenager, a fifteen-year-old who says, "Well, this is what I want to do." I think that you do, as the parent, say to them, "You are not old enough or mature enough to make this decision. You're just not. We know what's best for you. We love you, and we want you to come come with us. We want you to um, to be with us because." Believe me, you will understand. I hope you understand later on, and I hope you do it. Um, I hope you come with us freely. Right. But for right now, 
I'm sorry, but we are going to force you to come to church just as we force you to go to school. That's right. Just as we force you to eat dinner with us right. um, because we love you. And they just do not have the maturity necessary to make that kind of decision. And ultimately, I really believe that that's what teenagers want. They want to have, they want to know you love me enough to make me do something that I don't want to do. And they're, maybe that's not going to be, that's not their conscious reaction for sure. <laughs> right. But that is their subconscious knowledge that you are a wall. You are a wall. And a, what is a wall? A wall can be security. A wall is shelter. And that's a good thing. Right. You know, that's not right. a bad thing. So. All right. Well, um, I don't know if this is the last uh, section here, but but kind of managing kids. Oh wait, can I just say one? I just want to say one more thing about the whole like democracy thing. Oh sure. In this one, um, in in the article here, uh, there's this woman whose quotes is quoted by saying. Uh, for about her children, I want to be more of their friend than their mom and give them room to express themselves and be little people because I never felt like I got that opportunity. Again, I just feel like that just like, just struck me because you know what my mom would always say to me? She would say, you know what? You have, I'm not going to be your friend because you have lots of friends, yeah. but you only have one mom. You only have one dad. Yeah, yeah so true. And that's what kids need they don't yeah. need another friend you know and we as parents have to realize that i hope my ultimate goal is to be my child's friend yeah when they're an adult when they're an adult i want to be their friend <laughs> but if um for when they are 10 years old i really don't want to be the friend and really they don't really want you to be their friend they want they want you to be their mom yeah, and give them yeah. that guidance that they that's need. That's what they need. That's what they need. So moving on to kind of how uh, millennials, uh, again, predominantly managing uh, their kids in their kids' lives. In in the days gone by, we had helicopter parenting, right. you know, uh, but millennials uh, really frown upon this, um, and they see this new technique really as drone parenting. Uh, the, the parents are still there, but they're following and responding to their kids more than directing and scheduling them. So they're like a drone is far enough away, but you're still you're still observing, you're still watching, you're still present. So a good example of this would be instead of not leave, like when your baby is sleeping, you don't you're not hovering right above them in the same room of them watching them sleep, but. You do Put have a monitor, ha yeah, <laughs> yeah, have a video or a monitor on that you can hear all the time. Now, of course, I had a baby monitor too, but I think it's that paranoia of oh. oh, I have to have the baby monitor on. Oh my gosh, I blah 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 blah. Is, you think you it's know. a paranoia? Yeah. Uh, okay. Yes, for oh, okay. many moms, it okay. is for yeah. sure, yeah. for sure. Well, early, yeah. But, yeah. but what I would say is that you need to realize you need to not be paranoid yeah. because there are some times that. Maybe the baby monitor won't work. Maybe your child will wake up crying. Maybe they'll be crying for 15 minutes. And guess what? They will never remember that. Ever, ever. They will be fine. No baby has exploded because of crying too much. It's okay. You do not need to feel guilty about that. You do not need to feel bad about that. It happens. You are there for them consistently every day of their life. You love them. You hold them. 15 minutes of crying and you didn't hear them isn't the end of the world. Right. And I think a lot of parents are afraid of that because they never want their kids to experience anything that's uncomfortable that's or right. difficult. Yeah, so they're not necessarily directing all their kids and not there every second, but right. they're really super responsive. And mm -hmm. they're, they're there ready to pick catch them, them up, catch them when they're falling and, and all of that. Okay, Right. And I think that that's a problem. Because we, we really need to let our kids fail. We need to let them fail and we need to let them be uncomfortable or, you know, the situation is not going to be perfect for our kids all of the time. Kids are much more resilient than we think they are because in our world that is so focused on instant gratification, like, oh, what's that song? I'll just look it up on iTunes and buy it. Oh, that looks like a good book. Oh, I'll just buy it on Amazon or Netflix, you know? Oh, there's that movie. We can watch it right now, right? Right this second. It's just instant gratification all the time. And so we as parents, we need to realize that our kids don't need that from us as That's right. well. That's right. We need to teach them to be, to wait. We need to teach them to be patient. That's right. We need to pe teach them that, no, everything isn't going to be perfect every second. And I think that it kind of starts when they're little, and then you really have to start fighting against that 
when they're teenagers. I mean, I find it really difficult. Right. But again, it, it's like a lot of things. It's you got to build it slowly and you got to build it mm -hmm. early. And those mm -hmm. foundations, you'll you'll be able to draw upon that with greater strength in your relationship and your integrity and your, kind of your consistency of being an intentional parent. So the long, the sooner you can start that, the better right. for everybody. And it's good for kids to learn sacrifice. That's right. You know, and it's good for them to learn self-denial. Yeah, like that whole... Delayed gratification. Exactly. The whole idea of delayed gratification and self-denial is just like almost foreign to our culture today. Right. And we need to teach that to our children. And this is one way that, I mean, many times I'm discouraged <laughs> in having so many kids and like, how can I teach them all of these virtues, all of these things? Well, that this is one advantage if you do have a lot of kids, if you have little ones... There is nothing that can teach sacrifice like a baby yeah. or a child. When you have an older child taking care of a younger child, they really have to sacrifice for them. That's and right. I think There's that no that's option, a, right? Exactly. And they do have to wait. And they don't get what they want all the that's time. Right. And so this is a way in which families, the, the family can really be a place where kids learn that. That's right. It's a great, I mean, family is na a natural place for people to grow up it's right tra training and, ground. and you, it's a training ground it's a it, it's the it's the school of love and virtue mm -hmm. and uh, the holy father just said that i put it up on uh, this past week uh one of the comments he made just that if the exact quote I'll, I'll mix up a little bit but you know if if the family isn't teaching um love then nobody really can you know, right. or something like that. And this is where it all starts. This is where the virtues, this is where the self-denial, this is where, you know, doing something for someone else, doing mm -hmm. something for a cause greater than self, doing, you know, right. getting out of who you are and your profile and your status update and your whatever mm -hmm. else right. and to get into a, um, you know, much more virtue-based And ver really living. what I feel like I need, we need to be modeling for our children and preparing them for is for this relationship with God. I want them to be obedient to me because I want them to be obedient to the Lord. I want them to sacrifice so they sacrifice in the little things in life so they can choose sacrifice later and then that will help them in their path to holiness. I mean, I want them to have that relationship with God and so and God isn't, you know, God's not running a democracy. That's right. That's <laughs> you know, right. he has his his word that we need to obey and listen to because we want our children to be happy. That's right. And that's the only way they're going to be happy. And the, um, the family is the model upon which we, our whole faith, uh, really comes from the Trinity is a family. Mm -hmm. We're modeling that for our kids mm -hmm. so they have a clear understanding of who God the Father is, who and why Christ and the Holy Spirit are a part of this. Right. And all of that you know, is very earthy in our family life. And we've got to recognize our strengths, our own weaknesses personally, as a couple, and with our family situation, recognizing that we're influenced. We're influenced by the generation from which we came. Mm -hmm. And we've got to take that into account and right. recognize it. We all have our own crosses and challenges and, and uh, burdens, if you will, that, that will uh, maybe trip us up. Uh, but we can we can overcome this. God's given us an intellect, a will, and uh, and His grace to allow us to, to make, a, make a better start. So we hope that this podcast is helpful for you to see maybe how you've been influenced by the culture and maybe some of the things that have crept into your parenting and just to realize, you know, there there's some dangers there. So. And I'd love, I'd love to actually hear from some millennials. You know, did you, do you agree with that? Do you disagree with that? Do you find yourself in any of these things? Are there other areas that you've found? Um, and, and if you, you are a millennial, please just let us know just what, what your thoughts are. That would really be helpful. Um, but also, if you, if you know uh, other millennials, friends that might value from this, we'd love to hear from them, too, and just to kind of get their reaction to these ideas and thoughts and uh, yeah. see if it fits, see if it resonates. So um, if you like the, the program, we uh, really want you to, to share it on Facebook or Twitter or wherever. Um, Vine, I don't even know. Make a mashup just for us. I don't know. Um, but if you can uh, uh, share that around or make a uh, comment and a rating on iTunes, that would be great. Uh, but until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you. <laughs>